The Justice League have had countless renditions and reboots, but today we're looking at a smaller story that I think understands the characters well and is generally as wholesome as the real world Batman book that I covered in a previous video. Written by J.M. DeMatteis and illustrated by G.L. Barr, this is Real World's Justice League of America. Before we get started, I'm going to be using each character's name and superhero alias pretty loosely. Thanks, and without further ado, uh, let's go. Our story starts out in Evanston, Illinois, October 1999. Here we are introduced to Michael Riley, a teacher who has just returned home from work, only to open up his computer and see an email inviting him to an executive Halloween party in New York hosted by his childhood friend, Bernard Epstein. Michael then turns around to see a box sitting on a table. He opens it to find his Superman costume. He's our Superman. We're then transported back to 1975 in a flashback showing young Michael playing and fighting Brainiac alongside his friend friends. Not important, but I think it's funny that for these kids, Brainiac is just a garbage can. Anyways, here's our Justice League. We got the Atom, Superman, Wonder Woman, and Elongated Man. The flashback ends on a nice note saying how no matter how far you travel in life, you'll never have friends like you had when you were 10. We then cut to a comedy club where we meet Nick DeMarco. He's on stage and bombing hard. He even does the Jerry Seinfeld joke. Nick then passes out cold on stage only to wake up and get told he stinks and the only reason people are at his show is because Nick had a part on a TV show a while back. After that, Nick walks back to his hotel, finding a box in his room. He opens it to find his costume. He's our elongated man. Boom! We're back in the past and elongated man shouts to look out because Amazel's hurling explosive boogers. Then, the Adam and elongated man have a word about the legitimacy of Amazel's boogers. While they discuss pressing matters, Superman calls out for help. He's pinned down by a kryptonite beam. So Wonder Woman comes to his rescue and smashes the beam with her bare hands. In the distance, they spot a stair case. They all pretend it's a space station and go on over to it. Once they get near, they hear laughing. They come in to see a kid they know smoking. Ricky Barrison, the bad boy of the group. Him and Superman have the following exchange and to me it feels very grumpy Batman. Ricky, what are you doing? What's it look like I'm doing? I'm smoking a cigarette. Got a problem with that? Look at you. Bunch of dumb little kids playing your dumb little games. <laughs> We then cut to Ricky in the present of the story. He's an adult smoking a cigar now. And he's also the executive producer of a science fiction series called Captain Starrier. We then see him being a dick to a writer for the series, shredding their papers. But after that, he's alone in his office when his assistant brings in a box from Bernard Epstein. We then learn of Bernard's nickname from Ricky, Barnyard. We also learn that Bernard is the richest person in the world. Ricky then opens the box to find his costume inside. He's our Batman. And we're back in the past. All of them are standing around asking Ricky why he's smoking. Elongated Man calls him a dick. Then Ricky shouts at Barnyard for touching his comic book. They then have a little argument until Ricky does an I'm Batman moment. All of the kids flee from him. Superman and Wonder Woman discuss how he's under a madness virus from the Joker as Batman chases down Elongated Man and gives him a bat wedgie. Superman jumps onto Batman with the cure and says they've got to save Batman and then save the world. Cut to O'Hare Airport, now October 30th, a day before the Halloween party. Our Superman is on a plane. A sexy woman approaches him and starts to hit on him. She offers to tie him up with her magic lasso, and at that moment, he realizes it's Karen Steuben, our Wonder Woman. She says Barnyard's men picked her up in San Francisco. The flight attendant comes to tell them to buckle up, and Michael tries to say she looks good, but she cuts him off and says she knows. We then cut to New York. Bernie stands in front of a mirror and puts on a helmet, as he is Despero. Just as that is happening, Michael and Karen show up to Epstein Tower. And no, not that Epstein. They have the whole top floor to themselves. Michael comes out in his Superman suit. He then asks about her new look, and she explains that she did well in school, went to Harvard and bettered herself in every way, shape, and form until the only thing left to better was her body, so she got plastic surgery. As she tells this, she comes out in her Wonder Woman costume and Michael is speechless. She looks sexy, presumably, I mean, the art doesn't really do much for me here. Wonder Woman proceeds to get on top of him and we cut to a later scene. Superman is sitting at the bar being served by Aquaman when Elongated Man shows up. He's heavier than what was expected because his childhood nickname was Stick. 
Batman makes an entrance next with a line about people killing themselves or something. Karen shows up, shits on Linda Carter, and all the boys are speechless, just like Michael was. Superman tries to have a word with her because he feels weird about sleeping with her, but she blanks him. Wonder Woman throws a camera to a waitress who is dressed as Zatanna. As they pose, Batman gives a toast to them, dubbing them as the Justice League of Chicago. But just then, the lights cut out. They come back on moments later, but now there's a Despero-shaped cookie jar on the bar that's not far away from them. <laughs> Superman opens it and pulls out a paper. Wonder Woman comes onto his shoulder asking, what's it say, handsome? Elongated man reads it out loud, saying that they have to wait for Green Lantern to contact them when he gets back from the planet Oa. Batman says he has the major willies, as we see they're being watched on a screen. Elongated man heads off to bed. Batman says to Superman that Elongated man has gotten fat. Wonder Woman also says that she's heading off to bed and asks if Michael is as well. He nervously says no, so just Batman and Superman are left at the bar. Batman asks what's up with Wonder Woman and Superman. He says nothing and the two go on to reminisce about the old days. They talk about how they were best friends, and it's really sweet. But eventually, their conversation leads them to the topic of Ricky's brother, who's in jail. A silent moment takes place between them. But Batman breaks the tension by going to hit on a waitress dressed as Black Canary. Superman then heads off to bed. The next morning, Superman is then woken up by a green glowing light as we hear a rendition of the Green Lantern Oath. In brightest day, in really dark night. No bad guys shall escape my sight. Huh? Let those who worship evils might yada yada yada. Yada yada yada? Who the hell are you and what are you doing in my room? The lights slip on and Batman says some shit like he's Green Lantern back from meeting with the Guardians of the Universe. I love that Green Lantern is just some old guy who's gonna chauffeur them around for a bit. Elongated Man makes a comment about how superheroes don't lie to each other and only lie to their significant others. Then Batman says Hal Jordan's gonna take them somewhere. The old fuck doesn't even know who Hal Jordan is. I love it. They rip off Superman's blanket, revealing him as naked, and he screams for them to get out. Next, we see they're in a limo with Green Lantern driving, until it breaks down. They all hop out. Batman and Elongated Man are pissed, saying they're gonna go back to the hotel and leave all this bullshit. But just then, they all notice flyers on the wall with the faces of Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, and Elongated Man. It says where the party is, and they are all drawn back in. Superman gets a little overexcited at the idea of a treasure hunt to the party, but then he gets immediately punched in the gut by a tough guy on the street. I don't know why this happens, to be honest though, he didn't really do anything to them. The guys were looking funny at them, and they did say that he looked like Superman, so they wanted to know if he could take a punch like Superman could take a bullet. Wonder Woman helps him up. The kid from the cover of Mad Magazine shoots his shot with Wonder Woman. Then she kicks his ass as they decide to walk to the party. Batman asks about Superman's marriage, and he says that his wife, Pam, one day just packed her bags and left him. Elongated Man chimes in and mentions that he's also separated from his wife. Wonder Woman says she's still waiting for Mr. Right, then Batman says some nihilistic shit about how people suck or whatever, but Superman stays optimistic and says he doesn't believe that people suck, and I think that's very Superman. Batman sees a couple fighting on the street, so he steps in against Superman's advice. He grabs the guy and does the I'm Batman thing. We then see him with stars around his head because the chick hit him. 20 blocks later, they're talking about each other as we see Despero is still observing them. Then they finally arrive at the world of heroes. They go in and it's dark. But in the darkness, they see four supervillains with spotlights on them. I can only make out Dr. Light, Starro, and Felix Faust. But the wiki says the other guy is just Frankenstein. Batman gets ready to fight, but Frankenstein says like hey dude what the fuck we're not gonna fight we're just actors the bad guys then tell the justice league to follow the trail of stars but just then the room begins to fill with smoke elongated man says he's allergic to the smoke so they all leave the building Elongated Man and Batman have had enough again and say they're gonna go home. Superman talks them into staying though. They all look at the ground and see stars on the sidewalk. It's a line so there's two directions to follow. They split into two groups with each going different ways. Superman immediately grabs Elongated Man and heads off, leaving Batman and Wonder Woman walking off arm in arm. We continue with Superman and Elongated Man as they walk and talk. Michael asks about Nick's personal life, saying that Nick seems depressed. Nick responds that all comedians are depressed, but Michael reassures Nick that he can say what's really going on 
because they're friends. Nick explodes, saying that just because they were friends as kids doesn't mean that they're friends now, and how Michael barely knows Nick, so he shouldn't ask about his life. On an equally depressing note, we catch up with Rick and Karen. They are talking about each other's lives too. Rick says Karen's amazing and she says that he's a smart psycho. He asks about how she's able to be so confident. She's smart, gorgeous, makes a lot of money and has men pining for her. But her response is that nothing feels real. She bursts into tears as she says the only thing that does feel real to her is love. We cut back to Michael and Nick as he apologizes for his outburst, stating that he isn't in a good place right now because of his career, but Michael says not to worry about it. He understands, mentioning his hate for his job and how he loves a woman who doesn't care about him. Nick claps back, saying how at least Michael won't be dead in a few years. Before Michael gets a chance to ask Nick what he meant by that, they're separated by a crowd. Cut back to Karen and Rick. He tells her that when they were kids, he idolized her and thought she was the coolest and how he even had a crush on her. She says he's a tough guy and asks why he never told her before. And he says that he didn't because he was a tough guy and didn't want to blow his tough guy image. They get stuck in a crowd of bees, so Rick says fuck it and decides to take Karen to dinner, but as they prepare to leave, they are blocked by a parade. And back again to Michael and Nick. They found each other again. Michael says that Nick can write off their friendship as cheap nostalgia, but he believes that their whole group of friends were family. This touching moment is ruined as they are grabbed and carried away by Solomon Grundy and Big Sur. They are thrown into a dark room where Karen and Rick are already in. They are locked inside of a parade float. Eventually, they get out, and to their surprise, they are standing in the middle of Yankee Stadium. Finally, now Superman is saying how this is actually getting annoying, but just then, a helicopter flies down. Despero, master of the universe, comes down and calls them his slaves in a non-racist way, presumably. He has a little speech about how, when they were growing up, he was the Atom, but now, as an adult businessman, he's more like a supervillain. Wonder Woman asks what this whole thing has been about, and Despero says that he missed them. He misses what they used to be. They talk more and he says that when they were kids, pretending to be the Justice League was when they were everything he wants to be. Decent. Moral. Selfless. Superman fires back, saying that he is those things because he donates to charity. But nah, he just does that for the tax break. He then quotes something Michael said earlier to Nick in a private conversation about how the best friends you'll ever have are the ones you made when you were 10. They immediately ask how he knows that and he admits that he's been spying on them. Despero is basically sad because he's the richest man in the world and nobody is his friend. Superman says that if he's been spying on them, then he should know that they're all in a bad place right now as well. I think this next bit is my favorite part of the whole book. Despero then goes into detail about each of their lives, one at a time, showing them that even if they feel lost, the positive impact they've had on the world is undoubtedly real. They're a force for good, just like the Justice League should be. First off, he says how Michael is an amazing teacher, how students credit him as the reason to their success. He's a superhero every time he walks into a classroom, inspiring students and giving them the tools for a good future. Second, Bernie says that when Nick does shows in New York, he'll come secretly to watch and that Nick is amazing. And even when he was on that shitty TV show, he was great and that his gift is that he can take any material and make it shine. Third, Bernie moves on to Ricky saying how despite how much of a dick Ricky was as a kid, that he still looked up to him regardless and how his book series Captain Starrier is important because of how many people connect with it. Ricky apologizes for being an asshole but Bernie stops him, stating that Ricky's dad was an abusive drunk, that his mom died when he was just 8 and how he dropped out of school at 15. Yet despite all of this, he's doing just fine and how Bruce Wayne's personal life wasn't amazing either. Lastly, Karen says that whatever Bernie shows, it won't change her mind. She will still believe that she's just a fake bitch through and through, and nothing at all like Wonder Woman. Despero says she's a soulless corporate shark, but he knows that on the weekend, she works with battered women, offering her services and her heart free of charge to those who need it, just like how Wonder Woman would. Bernie closes us all up, stating that they are who they are because of the lessons they learned growing up reading Justice League. He continues until Ricky cuts him off. Nick jumps into the conversation saying how at least they're all not dying like he is. Bernie lets it out that Nick just has a double hernia. Michael's pissed off that he made a fuss about dying when it's something so treatable. Just then, Despero makes a break for the helicopter. He hops in, only to emerge from it again as the Atom. 
The last time we see them all together, they're running on the field together, playing. The story ends on a sweet, somber note. We're back with Michael in his house at his computer. Through text boxes, we learn that Nick got his hernia surgery paid for by Bernie and his career is on the up as he got a part in an Adam Sandler movie. Ricky and Karen realize they're in love and get married and have a baby lickety split. Bernie goes radio silent and is presumed to be back in New York running his empire. And Michael is finally done with his wife. He's back to teaching and is now working on a book. All in all, he thinks that the Justice League would be proud of who they are. The end. Personally, I think this story was good. The themes and subject matter really connected with me. The feeling of getting older and growing distant with old friends, and even the feeling of not living up to certain childhood ideals that superheroes embody are things that I personally go through, and I feel that this story captured those feelings really well. I know that this story didn't include any literal superheroes per se, but the drama and the raw nature of the many conversations between the characters in this book carried weight with me, so much so that even with the lack of a bombastic superhero fight, it didn't feel like much of a loss at all. I was engaged ass to tits, front cover to back cover. The art was beautiful, the subject matter isn't weak and spineless, but also, the funny bits are cute. I think this is a great Justice League book, even if it barely is. But anyways, search up this book for yourself, I think it's worth a read. Follow me on Twitter for more daily superhero shit and other shenanigans if you want. Uh, thanks for watching, cheers.